والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله Welcome to this episode of the Beauties of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about a subject I was speaking about in another episode, talking about preservation or continuing and authenticating the information or sources that we have in Islam. I want to share with you something funny that happened to me so you can see my perspective and where I'm coming from when I talk about this topic. When I was first learning something about Islam, actually I was trying to convert a Muslim to become a Christian. This was in Texas many years ago. <coughs> Bismillah. And one of the things that we did is what I just did right there. I said, Bismillah. I pick up something, I start, and he'd say, well, why don't you say in the name of God before you begin? I say, what does that mean? He says, before we do anything as Muslims, we invoke the name of Allah. So if you say, Bismillah, then this is good for you. I said, okay, Bismillah. Then I came to find out something amazing. He told me that in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tells us that we get blessings for all the things that we do if we do them for Allah. So instead of just getting in your car and going to the store, you do it for Allah. You say, Bismillah, you get into your car, and then you go to the store. So now you're getting reward while you're driving. You enter into a building and you say, Bismillah. Hmm. Even before you go to the bathroom, Bismillah. In the name of Allah. And all of this will do what? It will give you rewards with Allah and protect you as you're going along through your life. And I said, well, this sounds good. Why not? It won't hurt anything. Along the way, while I was talking with my friend, I was really trying to convert him. And he told me, you know, if your religion's better than mine, I'll go to your religion, but you need proof. And when I had a discussion with him about what kind of proof was he talking about, he was explaining that the things of Islam are still preserved today. The Quran, as we've mentioned in many of our programs, is totally and completely preserved in the hearts and minds of over 10 million human beings living today around the world. And that all the Muslims in the world are memorizing at least portions of the Quran. All Muslims, even little children, because the first words of the Quran are what? Bismillah. The thing that I just said when I started doing this, the thing that I said when I opened up the program, all of our programs, and you listen, when we start up Beauties of Islam, what do we always say? Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. And this is the same as the Quran starts. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So from the very beginning, as a Muslim, even the small children are learning to recite the things that we have from the Quran. But also along the way is the preservation of the teachings of Muhammad to explain how to implement the teachings of the Quran. They work together. They're called hadith or stories, and they're preserved in the sunnah or the way of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Some of the early scholars, uh, early Islam, just within a few decades after the time of Muhammad, realized the importance of preserving each and every one of his sayings and teachings. Therefore, they were careful to preserve it by checking their own memories and then teaching the next generation of Muslims exactly what was said, how it was said, and describing the events that went along with it. So that these narrations would be passed on in oration form as well as being written down. We have a series of books today that you can read when you hold it in your hand. That's a book, of course. But there are also narrations which are done orally. And they are exactly the same as what we find in these books. And these also are passed down in the same way, in the same methodology or menhaj that it was done with the Quran itself. So when you get into the bigger schools of knowledge in Islam, you have the chance then to begin to really use your memory. Because instead of just reading something and writing it down and passing a test, one of the tests is how much of the Quran do you know? from memory. 
until you've memorized all of it, you're not even considered a scholar. And then after that, to memorize these hadith in the Arabic language. And when we say to memorize these stories of Muhammad, peace be upon him, we're not just talking about the matin or text. We're talking about knowing the rawaya or chain of narrators. All of this in memory to be sure that you know who said it, where you got it from, and how authentic it is, and then what is the exact text in the Arabic language. The Prophet Muhammad, for instance, is reported to have said, Adunya sijnul mu'min wa janatul kafir. The meaning here in English more or less is that the life of this world, the dunya, the life of this world is a prison to a true believer, but is the only paradise for a disbeliever. Now, do you know for sure if he really said it? Well, we do because we can take you to the book and show you exactly where it is. And we can also take you to the scholars of memory and they can tell you exactly how it was said even and on what occasion and what it referred to. Many of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are preserved so authentically that it leaves no doubt in the mind of the one who is studying this that for sure this must be something amazing just as the Quran itself. There's a lot about this I want to tell you, but let's take a break. Give you time to think about what I just said. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back with more Beauties of Islam. Islam is keeping up the pace. Islam is for every race. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورت للقرآن ترتيلا. Learning how to recite the Quran properly. Learning the meaning of what we recite. Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite. Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. We we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. We're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation. And we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which we'll state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. Will come true. In- Alhamdulillah, we're back and you're watching the beauties of Islam. We've been talking about the preservation of the Sunnah or the way of Muhammad by way of Hadith or the stories that have been passed on generation upon generation upon generation. These were done in two forms. One in the oral text, as I've been explaining to you, from mouth to ear, and the other they were preserved also in the writings of the teachers and scholars of Islam so many centuries ago. What is interesting to note is that even today there is something called ijaza, where there's like a diploma handed to one who has gone through the trouble to sit and listen and memorize from his teacher the Quran and the relative hadiths or teachings of Muhammad to go along with this. In this, the person not only has memorized the Quran, but they've also memorized the Hadith that go along with this, and they've memorized the names of the teachers who have passed this on. They've memorized also the, uh, the teachers' teachers and the teachers' teachers' teachers, the names and things about them, all the way back to the very lips of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, If you think that that's something, you think that's amazing, I will remind you that human beings are not able to do something like this on their own. But rather, this is something that is only particular to the teachings of Islam. These two things, the Quran and the Sunnah, are preserved like this. If you consider, for instance, in literature, the famous works called the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are very much attributed to one called Homer, In fact, if you study literature, you'll find that he's not really the author of these great works, but rather it's something produced by his students who said that basically he would have said it this way. He would have written it this way because they knew him and they knew his style. 
<coughs> it was also something very acceptable, even at the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, for someone to take it upon themselves to write something down and then say that it came from the prophet Moses or the prophet Abraham or the prophet Enoch and so on. What they did was to write in the spirit of that person and then attribute it to them. Now, this would not be anything different than what we find today if, if I were, for instance, to go to a place where Abraham Lincoln grew up and walk around and see what it was like, imagine his place of birth, the place is still preserved there, and read some of the documents that he had written, and then on my own begin to describe something out and say, you know, this is something he probably would have said, and this is the style he would have said it in, and then sign it, Abraham Lincoln. And then say, you know, I was writing in the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. If you study the Apocrypha from the Bible, you find out that what I said is exactly true of many of the old books that are not acceptable, really, as canon for the Bible itself. It, whether you're a Catholic or an Orthodox or a Protestant Christian, you know that there are books that are still not part of the Bible even today. They're called Apocrypha. And if you check it out, you'll find that that's how these books were written. I'm sure people meant well. There's no doubt about that. And they said they wrote it in the spirit of a particular prophet, or they wrote it in the spirit of God, or they wrote it in the spirit of something. But after checking it out, a lot of those who authenticated the various different Bibles decided to leave those out. Even at the time of the Protestant Reformation, there were books being tossed out of the Bible by some of the scholars saying they weren't authentic enough and they weren't really testable and they didn't fit with the canon at that time and they also didn't go along with some of the teachings they had. So the Orthodox Bible having 78 books is totally different than the Catholic Bible having only 73 books, which is again even different from the Protestant Bible, the very famous King James Version, which has only 66 books in it. All of them are very similar, and this is not the point here, but the, what we're trying to say is that none of them are exact. What we do know, though, is that the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the teachings from the Quran not only work together, are homogenous, that flow well together, but they're exactly preserved today and understood in the exact style of Arabic language called Fusha. This uh, classical Arabic is still available to learn today, and you can hear the sound exactly as it came. This is not true of other ancient texts. For instance, the Kone Greek, we were talking about Homer's uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, you can't find that today in the exact pronunciation because the language is no longer spoken. The same would be true about the ancient Hebrew, the ancient Aramaic, and also the Kone Greek of the time of Jesus, peace be upon him. So what's nice really here is that Allah has preserved both the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad without question. We can easily say that this is right and attest to the fact that the Quran and the Sunnah have been totally and completely preserved by our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing? Yeah, it's amazing. That's why it's called Mu'ajiza. Mu'ajiza means miracle. And this is one of the miracles of Islam and certainly one of the beauties of Islam. For more, visit our website, beautiesofislam.com. Until next time, peace. Salaam alaikum.